Hello everyone, welcome to Hackers SAT Math. For today's lesson, we'll be going over the no calculator section of the test that was included at the end of the lecture part, right? The diagnostic test. We have the no calculator part and the calculator part and fro. This lesson, we'll be going over how many questions? 20 questions, right? So I guess probably at this point, you guys have already finished solving the questions, you guys graded it, and this is sort of a review session for all of us together. So I think you guys are ready right away. Okay, let's begin. So number one presents a basic equation and the setup given. Let's read it together and pinpoint what they're asking for, and then we'll do the solutions together, okay? So 12x is equal to 240, and they're telling us that x, this variable, represents the number of hours a person works each week in a week, and 12 represents the amount of money that she is paid per hour. So I guess the 12 is represented by the hourly rate which Maya is paid. And they're asking for the value of 240. How do we interpret this in a real life situation? The amount of money multiplying by the rate equal to the total amount. So you just have to look for the expression of total amount given in the answer choices. It doesn't take too long when you go through them yourselves, right? So as a practice, let's just see the remaining answer choices and see what they're asking for and why they don't necessarily work for number one. So answer choice A states the number of hours Maya works per hour. What is represented by that? It's the x variable, right? And B, Maya's hourly wage in dollars per hour. What did they tell us? Oh, we know that she receives $12 per hour. That's the rate expression we're given. And D, the total number of hours that Maya must work to earn $12. Can you guys tell me the answer for this? She only needs to work an hour to get that money, right? Okay, it was a nice and easy warm up for number one. So let's move on to the second multiple choice question here. So another expression given as the equation and they're asking for a final value of six minus two X. Notice how we're doing a no calculator section. So it can't be that difficult. So what is the first step that you guys thought of? when we look at the original equation. So we have a four multiplied to the entire expression and I think that the final answer or the final expression we're interested in is simply the double of whatever goes in the parentheses, right? You guys can make that connection. So why don't I just divide both sides by four and I simplify the given expression as three x, three minus x is equal to one and double that equation is double the constant value so you don't even need to do anything. So you circle C and we're done. So let's do a little more, a question a little bit more difficult. Um, number three is another algebraic equation which involves the second degree for the x variable. So we have a basic quadratic equation where the highest exponent involving the x variable is a power of two. And they're telling us that the constant value c is equivalent to 36 and what are they asking for? The solution for x, it simply means solve this equation, look for the x variable to make this hold true. So let's just substitute the value real quick and push it to the right hand side. So can you guys tell me, we don't even need a calculator, what value squared makes a positive value of 36? So we square root both sides and don't forget the plus and minus, therefore we have the positive 6 and the negative 6, that's why you circle C and that was it, right? Simple. Very good. So let's move on to the fourth question of number four. It seems a little bit more complicated compared to the first three. So I guess the warm up questions were enough with the three done. And we're involving linear equations. We can see that the highest power involved in the x variable is one. That's why we can extrapolate the fact that, oh, it is a line. So what are they asking for? The ordered pair satisfies the systems of equations above. It simply means that whatever x and y we're involving, it is true for both the first equation and the second equation. And they're asking for the difference between the two values. So simply put, all we need to do is solve for the systems of linear equations. Well, first of all, when I look at my first equation, I don't really like fractions, and I think it's the same for you guys, right? So let's flip the five value to the right-hand side, and it becomes a multiplicated form of positive 10. And I'll just rewrite my second equation as it is with the x and y variables on the left-hand side. So it becomes a negative x, positive 4y, and the 1 is pushed to the right side, so it becomes a negative 1. So from this point on, what can I do to find the difference in a very easy way without a basic substitution? Well, I think when I first just simply add the two equations, the x variable is eliminated because x 
plus a negative x simply makes it a sum of 0. So we can see that the overall value of 5y is equivalent to the sum of the constant values, which equivocates to 9. Therefore, I can conclude that my y value has a fraction form of 9 over 5. And how do I further find the value of my x in this case? You guys can simply substitute it into the first equation or the second equation, whichever looks simpler. So let's just use the first equation here. I'll write it down right in the parenthesis form. So y added to x is equal to 10, and all you have to do is move the variables to one side and the constant values to the other side. Therefore, x is equal to the difference of 10 and 9 over 5. And you guys can make the least common multiple for the denominator form. So the first integer value is equivalent to multiplying 5 top and bottom. So it's 50 over 5, and you subtract it by 9. Therefore, I can conclude that my x value has a 41 over 5. Five. And this is not the final answer choice. We're looking for the difference once again. And we can see that all we have to do is 41 over 5 minus 9 over 5. And I think we can also do this without our calculator. Can you guys tell me the final form? 32 over 5, so you circle D. I do know that the numbers are a bit complicated, but the basic approach is the same for no matter which systems of linear equations you guys solve for. You guys have to use the basic substitution method or the direct application where you simply do what we just did. Add both equations or subtract both equations to extrapolate the simple version of whichever variable we have. Okay? So it was a nice practice here. So let's move on to the next question. Hopefully it was okay till um, question number four, right? So let's do number five real quick. What are they telling us? We are involving an absolute value function. So f of x is given by the absolute value of x minus one, everything subtracted by two. And they're telling us that it is graphed in the xy plane, the two dimensional plane, where we have the x axis and the y axis. And what is the question? What is the point at which the graph actually crosses the x-axis? Can you guys tell me a simple term that refers to this long definition? or the long explanation. It's simply asking for the x-intercept of the original equation. So first of all, let's approach this question in a graphical representation. When we have the basic x and y axis, can you guys tell me what the graph of simple absolute value of x looks like? It's the shape in a v, very good. So let's just draw that out real quick. And we're going to take this as our parent graph and apply some of the changes that they actually told us. So first, move. What happens if we take the absolute value and subtract a negative one inside of it? We're shifting it left or right. It works the opposite way around, right? So if there's a negative one, we're actually moving the entire graph one unit to the right, so we can move the v in a new form. So instead of getting this confused, I'll erase the original yellow graph that we had. And the final step, take this as a step-by-step -step process. What happens if we do a negative two to the entire graph? We're shifting the entire graph bottom, right? It goes down two units below. So it'll look something like this. And they're asking for the x intercepts, the points for which the graph is meeting the x-axis. So this is how you can understand it graphically, right? And then further confirming and finding the exact values for which this graph does indeed equal to zero. How can we finish this up? You let the entire equation equal to zero. Very good. That is how you find the basic x-intercept. So in this particular case, let's just let the entire absolute value function equal to zero, and we can move the constant value to the left-hand side. And through the basic lecture that we went over in the previous lessons, do you guys remember how to solve the absolute value equation? You simply transform the absolute sign to a parentheses and you solve the plus and minus version of it, right? So let me just rewrite this real quick, leave the original form, and then I'll break it down into two pieces here. I'll erase this a little bit. So let's solve the positive version for which the entire x minus 1 is positive. And then the negative version, you just apply the negative to the entire equation. So in the first case, we can see that our final value of x is equal to 3. And then for the second equation, don't get confused and make sure you always distribute the negative sign to the 
constant value inside of the parentheses. Therefore, I can further conclude that moving the x to the left side and the 2 value to the right hand side, I have a negative one as well. So among the answer choices, we're looking for two points. Specifically, they were a positive 3 and a negative 1, a positive 3 and a negative 1, and you don't even need to plug in the original value to find the y because through process of elimination, everything was just crossed off and then we can circle C and then we're done, okay? So for the first graphical representation, it was just a basic approach as to grasp what the diagram was looking for or the question was asking for, okay? Very good, let's move on to the next question. Ooh, we have a graph here. And let's just read the question and go through what they're asking for. So basically, with a graph given, it's represented in a line, right? The line A itself is graphed in the xy plane, and which of the following equations is perpendicular to line A? So if you miss that keyword, it's a common mistake that we all make, right? So the basic property, oh, I'll ask you guys a question. So what is the special property that holds true for perpendicular lines when two lines meet at a right angle? Their slopes, very good. The product of these two slopes must equal to a negative one. So let's apply this basic principle and the first step that we should take for solving this question is finding the slope of the original equation, right? So we can see that, let me just highlight the line for you here. An easy question, does this line have a positive slope or a negative slope? Negative slope, so we can see that whatever line we're looking at must have a positive slope, that's what we're looking for. And let's just find the exact values. Let's take the intercepts as our reference because they seem a lot clean and clear, right? So as x moves two units to the right, the y is moved two units down, therefore I can conclude for my original line the slope has a value of negative one, then I can further calculate or conclude that whichever line I'm looking at, the perpendicular line, it doesn't matter where it crosses, must have a slope of positive one. So let's go through the answer choices and just eliminate whichever does not have a slope of positive one. So for the first equation, what happens if you move the y to the right hand side? y is equal to negative x minus 12, therefore the slope is overall negative. And what about the second equation? If you rearrange the terms and set it equal to y is equal to, it becomes a negative x plus 7 as well, therefore the slope is negative 1, it doesn't work. What about the third equation? y is equal to, good, x plus or negative 2. That's why the overall slope becomes a positive 1 and it matches exactly as to what we anticipated. And then the last answer choice, just as an exercise, the slope has a value of negative 1 half, which does not work in this case. You guys understand?